BBC. That's why, um, before I start anything, uh, we've been praying, as you all know, for uh, Jason Delancey for some time now. And if you look back behind you, he walked in here. So, Jason, you stand up for the BBC. Alright, well we will be in Jonah today, so go ahead and open um, your Bibles to Jonah, uh, chapter 1. And let's start in prayer. Go be with me. Father, I pray that you will be with me um, in particular this day. Um, I pray that you guide the things that I say, that you guide your words, so that I say only what's in, accord in accordance with your word. Um, Lord, help me um, to explain this passage accurately and truly. Lord, I pray that as I do that, and as we together hear your word, that we will be changed and transformed and made more and more um, through your spirit, like your son Jesus. And we pray this all in his name. Amen. Okay, so chapter one. Uh, we introduced the whole book yesterday, or last Sunday. We're going to dive right in today. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Now, when we today refer to the word of the Lord, we're usually talking about the Bible, about uh, Scripture. Jonah would have had access to some of the written word. He probably would have had access to the first five books of the Bible. Um, the book was called the Gospel of the Law. He probably would have had that. Um, that was written by Moses, which was before his time. He may have had parts of 1st and 2nd Samuel. He may have had uh, some of the Psalms, uh, some of uh, Ecclesiastes, some of the Song of Songs, some of the early prophets. But he didn't have a complete Old Testament like we do. He would have known that, though, as the Word of God. But Scripture is not the Word of the Lord that we're referring to or is referred to in verse 1 here. This is God's directly spoken word to Jonah. Now, from the beginning of history um, to the time the last apostle died, probably John, at the end of the first century, God revealed his word, his truth, to living people, to prophets in the Old Testament and his apostles in the New Testament. Um, they took the word that God gave them and either preached it, proclaimed it, taught it, um, and or uh, wrote it down, or oversaw its, its writing. They, guided by the Holy Spirit, communicated it either in writing or in speech, um, in inaudibly and in infallibly. Now, Jonah was one of the God-appointed prophets of the Old Testament. We learned that last last week. So what that means is that Jonah knew knew God's word, knew God's voice. He would have not only read what little of God's word he had written, but he had heard God speak to him before the record. We saw that last week, 2 Kings chapter 14, when God came to Jonah and said, hey, go to King Jeroboam the second Tell him, I'm going to expand uh, the borders of Israel and give him victory over his enemies. Now that was a word that Jonah loved. He heard God say that to him. And he, he made a beeline to Jeroboam to let him know God was going to expand the territory of Israel. Jonah at that time recognized God's word and gladly proclaimed it. So when, sometime later, which is where we are now, Jonah hears, arise, go to Nineveh, he recognizes the voice. He knows who's speaking to him. He can't plead ignorance. He doesn't mishear and he doesn't misunderstand. He hears and he knows, but the content, go to Nineveh, fills his heart with dread. Now I say dread, and by that, I don't mean fear. 
Nineveh was a great and terrible city. We talked about this also um, last week. The home of the Assyrians, who were a ruthless and cruel and, and violent people. But Jonah is not a fearful God. When you look down um, in your text at verse 12, you'll see that Jonah is willing to be thrown into uh, the raging sea. Now, he doesn't know a whale is going to come pick him up. He just thinks he's going to be thrown into the sea. He's willing to be thrown overboard and drown to save uh, a ship full of, of pagan sailors. He's not afraid of death. He's not a fearful God. There's no indication anywhere that Jonah is afraid of him. That doesn't explain his actions. He is, however, full of dread. It's the kind of dread that should be and is probably familiar to everyone here who knows Jesus. It's the kind of dread that comes from knowing that you must do something. That God wants you to do something. And yet the thing that he wants you to do is so painful to contemplate, it just sets your heart in turn. When Ann and I uh, graduated from seminary, we had two bishops and went to into the process of your day through uh, Central New York. She was a student at Cornell University. And she went through the Episcopal Church chapter there, um, and her bishop Skip Adams, our old, our old bishop. Uh, I went into the process down in Texas, uh, Houston, Texas, uh, through uh, the Church of the Ascension there, and my bishop was from that same city. Um, now, the, the, the Episcopal Church, when you get out of seminary, you literally belong to your bishop. So wherever your bishop is, uh, if he sends you, you go back to the place where you came from. However, if you get married while you're in a seminary to somebody from a different place, the bishops have a problem. Usually what they do is they get together and they just decide, and you know, you're going to hear, one bishop decides he doesn't want the seminary back and he sends them somewhere else, or um, they just do some horse trading and decide amongst themselves and then send you one place or the other. Ours were really gracious. They said, you know what, guys? We love you. Why you uh, decide where you want to go? Now, Ann and I are opposites in, in many ways, but there were three things that we agreed about. One, uh, we both hated cold weather. <laughs> despised cold weather. Um, she's from Africa, which is not cold, and I'm from South Texas, which is not cold either. And by cold, I mean anything below 50 degrees. We just despised that kind of weather. The second thing we agreed upon, and I'm not trying to get political here, don't, get, don't worry, I'm saying we are both um, at the time of our marriage, political conservatives. And political conservatives from the South, is where I'm from anyway, assume that all the lands north of Virginia are populated by godless liberals uh, bent on social revolution and corrupting our morals. So I just thought, yeah, I'm not going to go up there. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, and uh, Saturday was, was pregnant. So we had a bunch of family, and a lot of family. Texas, and so we thought, you know, I don't want to, we want to have Emma, our first baby, surrounded by strangers. We like to have our first baby surrounded um, by family. So those three things together just kind of led us to believe that God was calling us um, down, down to Texas. Um, besides that, I, I met a few Yankees in my life. When I was in seminary, I met some. And uh, when I was uh, in the Army, I met some. And uh, just, I'm not, again, this is not, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but from a southern perspective, a southern mannerisms perspective, you guys are really rude. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so like, you, know, you know, we say yes sir and no sir to everybody when, when we're talking to them. You guys say yeah, no. Nah. You guys talk really fast. You have a weird accent. I mean, you're just, you, you're just, to us anyway, we're kind of, I met this guy back in seminary that I knew from New York City. I would pass him every day going to class, and I would say, hi, how you doing? I'd be doing in Texas, and he would just kind of look at me like I was from another planet, and grunt, or not, or something like that, but he wasn't very good. So anyway, all those things together combined, and we felt very sure that God wanted us to be in Texas, and not in Central New York. Although we thought 
let's give it a try because we don't want to make our bishop up here and think badly of us. We want to at least look like we're considering um, this is going to work. So um, uh, we thought we'd give it a try. Now, there was already in Texas a very nice big church that wanted us to come down there. Um, the, the assistant pastor position was open in this great church that we interviewed with, and they loved us, and they wanted us to come and visit. Now, the assistant pastor role is a sweet one, right? Because you just got to sit back there as the golden boy while, while the rector and the pastor makes all the really hard decisions, and um, people don't like the decisions, and you just, just sit there and say, oh, I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> so, so that was, yeah, I was, I was, I would, boy, I would love that. Um, a great church. Um, but we, again, decided we have to come back up and we have to at least give Central New York some appearance of consideration. So the only position available in Central New York was the rector of a tiny church called The Shepherd um, in a very small town by Houston standards um, of Binghamton. We visited in April. It snowed in April. <laughs> in Texas, it's 90 degrees in April, or 80 degrees, somewhere around there in April. It doesn't snow in Texas in April. Anyway, we met, that first trip we met uh, Bob and Cookie, who I think were here. I saw them earlier, and John, and Pauline, and um, Chris Jones, and for Yankees, they were pretty nice people. We were surprised. Uh, they were very nice and hospitable. Um, it, was, it was good to meet them, but our minds were made up. Our, 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 the made up minds were, were, that was solidified as they took us on a tour around Binghamton, and we saw lots of empty shops and this crumbling infrastructure and abandoned factories, and uh, we compared that in our minds to the sunny, shiny, golden, cosmopolitan city of Houston, Texas, and we thought, no way are we coming up um, to Binghamton. We didn't say that to them, that was just a way nice. So, so anyway, um, they took us to eat that evening, and this is when the wheels started to come off our plan. Um, they asked a huge number of questions, a lot of questions, about the Bible, about knowing God, um, about what it means to be a Christian, and they weren't testing us questions, like to see if we were solid or not. They were honest questions. They really wanted to know, and Anne and I both got the sense that there was a real hunger there for, for God. So that was trouble. Anyway, the next morning was Sunday. We um, went to the 10 a.m. service. They didn't have a 10 30 service. It was a 10 a.m. service. And um, at the 10 a.m. service, there were only 30 people there. It was very small. There were no Bibles in the pews. Um, nobody brought a Bible. No Bible studies were listed in the bulletin. No adult education. There was one Sunday school class for the kids, and there weren't many of them. And that's when I started to get really we concerned, instead of Anne. Because the church in Texas was in great shape. And they had a really good, faithful pastor who preached the Bible, preached the gospel. There was lots of kids, lots of uh, small groups and Bible studies. It was just thriving. And um, Anne and I got this kind of really suspicious feeling that maybe um, maybe God might want us to go up here, but we shoved it down you know, <laughs> really hard. Um, so that's, that's, we started to get concerned at, at that point. And then after church, we went down and we talked to people, and the same thing was there. It was there at David and Four. We were just really wanting to know about God. They're hungry. Good Shepherd was a hungry place with no pastor, and the place in Texas had everything um, they needed. So on the drive home, we did everything we could to rationalize that fact away, but it was unavoidably. We knew our Bibles well. Um, we knew that God's purpose in the world, His overarching purpose is for His people to make disciples and to extend His kingdom. And so we knew that following Jesus in that particular circumstance meant that we would have to come to things. We weren't, we weren't like a rolling guys or cutting over the goat and eating the intestines. We weren't like, um, you know, just uh, opening our Bible, whatever verse we saw, we at least knew it was hard to it was hard to miss that that was what God wanted us to do. But we tried. I wish I could say that um, coming to that conclusion when I drive home meant that we had made up our minds to cheerfully trust and obey because there is no other way 
uh, with the trust and the way of all I wish I could say that. But that's not what happened. I felt ambushed by God. I couldn't understand why God would send me to this tiny church in this tiny town, far away from family and friends, without any experience as a head pastor of anything. So I called my pastor. And what I hoped he'd say is I hope he'd give you like some like way of not making his choice so cut and dry and say, you know what? You gotta weigh your family and your your concerns about your future along with you know the church. You can't just let this thing dominate you. So I told him the story and these are the words out of his mouth. Well, he said, I don't even know why you're asking me. I said, What do you mean? He said, well, it seems pretty clear that God wants you to go to good. So mad, it's <laughs> really good. Um, so I knew he was right. He was right. He was right. But I dread. I dread. And that's the kind of dread I'm talking about. Now, if you've not felt that kind of dread in your life with Jesus yet, you will. You will. God's word has come to you and to me as it came to John. He has revealed his will and his purpose for his disciples very clearly. His purpose in the world is to use his church to make disciples and to extend his kingdom. To make disciples and extend his kingdom. His word to you is to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow him. So again, this is not this is not rocket science. This is not you're know, trying to find out what's God's will for my life. That God has revealed His will for the world, and His will for your life is to take up your cross and follow His hand. That means that you, in every decision you make in your life, and every decision I make in my life, and every decision we make is a, is a corporate body must, we must shape our lives around His revealed will and purposes. <coughs> That's how you think through where you want to go to grad school. That's how you think through where you're going to live. Who you're going to marry. What career you pursue. What you do when you retire. You know, hopefully, God's word. You know his purposes. Look at your life and ask, what do I need to do to get on board with what God's doing? That's the question. Now sometimes, often, the answer to that question is not what you want to do. Now, now this is important because I think in some I think sometimes we think that knowing God's will is this elusive, impossible, way off in the sky, un just unreachable goal. So we pray like before we pull into a parking lot. Oh Lord, is this parking lot where I'm supposed to park? Where I'm supposed to park? I mean, we, we do all these strange things to try and figure out what God's will for our life is. When God's will for our life is never revealed to us, it's to conform our life to his purposes. That's what we do. Look at your life and ask, what do I need to do to get on board? Every decision. Now your response to, to what you know God's will and purpose is to be, your response will make all the difference. Not so much for the world, don't get me wrong. God's got the whole world thing under control, with or without you. God wanted Good Shepherd out of the Episcopal Church. God wanted the people of Good Shepherd to hear the gospel, to learn the Bible. He wanted to use tiny Good Shepherd to extend his kingdom in Binghamton. And he would have done that with me or without me. Didn't matter. He was going to do that. The question is not whether uh, God's will will be done. The question is whether you will do the hard thing and deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. 
and say yes <coughs> when for whatever reason your heart is set on no. Now the irony of all this is, is that, and Jonah shows this in spades, the irony of all this is that the easy no always turns out to be harder than the most difficult yes. Always. Jonah knows God's will and purpose is to have mercy on him. He tells us that in chapter 4, we have to look it up, but that's what he says. The reason I ran is because I knew, Lord, that you are a merciful God, and I didn't want to make part God, Jonah knows that God's will and purpose is to have mercy on him, the, the home of idolatry, the home of human sacrifice, the home of cruelty at his, at his point in, in history, and the arch enemy of Israel. And that thought filled Jonah with dread. And so he decides to follow his heart and flee to Tarshish in the presence of the Lord. So Jonah's story begins with a no. A defiant, sinful no to God. But notice if you look down at verse 2 and verse 3, his actions for a prophet seem very odd. I mean, did you, you ask yourself when you look at this? Twice we're told in those two verses that Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I mean, did Jonah, the question is, did Jonah really? Think that if he got a boat and headed out like, toward the east, that he would get arrested and he would get away from the presence of the Lord? Is that really what's going on here? Some commentators say yes. They say, well, Jonah lived at a time when ancient people understood ancient deities to inhabit a certain geographical region. And if you could just get out of that deity's region, then you were out from under his jurisdiction and power. So here they say, Jonah is just trying to get out of Yahweh's jurisdiction. He thinks he can escape from uh, Yahweh's power. That's not true. The text shows us that's not true. Um, it makes no sense. Um, here's why. Jonah's flight, Jonah's fleeing from God, makes sense only if Jonah knows God to be sovereign over not only Israel, but over Nineveh. He's afraid that God is going to exercise his sovereignty and have mercy over Nineveh. He couldn't have that fear if he didn't believe that God is not only the God of Israel, but the God of Nineveh. Secondly, you'll note um, that when the sailors come to him, when the sailors come to him in the middle of the storm, they say, hey, we can't figure out what's going on here. The gods are going crazy. Why is the sea like this? If Jonah really believed that God's jurisdiction and power only existed within Israel, he would have said something like, I don't know. I have no idea. But that's not what he says. He says, um, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea in dry land. Jonah knows that his God rules over the entire cosmos. He knows that no storm rises, no wind blows, no rain falls apart from God's will and appointment. And he knows good and well that God is in Tarshish as well as in Israel. And that brings us right back to the question, but... If Jonah knows these things about God, it's evident right there in the text. Surely he knows there's no escape. What's he doing? What's he thinking? That's ridiculous. Surely he knows he can't escape God's presence. It doesn't make any sense for him to run from God. Why, why is he doing this? Right. It makes no sense. I know. And so do you. So why do we do it? You see the point? You see what the author of Jonah is doing here? That's the point of this first part of the book. Jonah is acting like a fool. His is not a logical, rational plan. But when we ask, why does Jonah think he can flee from God's presence? We hear, or we should hear, the question echoing back, and you, why do you think you can flee from my presence? Okay. 
Now let's notice how John flees. Verse 30. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So he goes down, he finds, he pays, he goes down again, he gets in, he goes. Now notice as the, the way this is written, there's a real busyness, there's a, there's a bustle in the text, there's a, there's a, there's kind of a, a, no peace here. There's a busyness to find, to do, and to go. And that gives us insight into Jonah's fleeing. You see, Jonah has given himself a project. Getting to Tarshish. That requires all of his time and all of his money and all of his energy. He set himself an agenda that demands everything that he has. And that, gee whiz, leaves him no time to hear God speak. No time or means to do God's will. Nineveh is in present-day Iraq. Tarshish is in Spain. It's not even on, it wasn't even on last week's map. It's harder to get to Nineveh from Tarshish than anywhere else known in the world to Jonah. It's like knowing you should be in Toronto and taking a ship to Antarctica. It's that far. I mean, it's just that kind of idea there. He's putting himself, Jonah's putting himself, in a position from which he thinks God will be forced to choose someone else. And this also, this, this way that Jonah flees, is also how we tend to flee. If I'm running from God, I'm going to set up some practical barriers in my life to keep me safe. To give me a legitimate reason not to do what I know God will have me do. So I sink myself into all kinds of self-appointed tasks. So I'm consumed by it. And I can't hear God's voice. I don't have time to hear God's voice. I don't have time to read my Bible this morning. I'm so busy. Look at my schedule. Oops, not this morning. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to pray. Who has time to pray? I've got six kids. I'm so busy with their stuff that I just don't have time to sit still and listen to them. How can I possibly go to church once a week? My goodness, I have so many things going on in my life, I can't quite make it. How can I possibly be a missionary because I've sunk all my life into this particular relationship, at this particular time, at this particular place? This is no way to possibly go. In those times, quiet prayer is my enemy. In those times that I'm fleeing from God, Scripture is my adversary. I will do everything I can to keep myself from it. In those times, church is my opponent, and I will do everything I can to stay out of it. Spare moments are dangerous when you're fleeing from God. And so you try not to have any. I've known many people, and I'm, I'm speaking also, of course, because I do this myself. I've known many people who've gone to very extreme measures to avoid what they know very well God wants them to do. I have a friend who knows he's called to the ministry. So instead of that, he sinks himself in a particular sin that he believes will disqualify him so that he doesn't have to do what he knows God wants him to do. There are people who tell me over and over again when I talk to them about the state of their life, where they're going, what they're doing, why they're doing this, why they're doing that. Well, I just, uh, I know that God wants me to do this one thing, but I know I'm so busy, I'm so tied up, I'm 
I'm so involved in this one area of my life that I can't possibly do it. No, it's a lie. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. God's purpose for you is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Where do you follow him? He's already told us. He's extending his kingdom and he's making more disciples. So that's your call. That's your mission. We focus on building relationships, building careers, learning subjects, learning hobbies, getting kids to this practice or that, that, that lesson or whatever, and that way we think we don't have to face God, we don't have to face ourselves, we don't have to deal with the things that God is saying. Very clearly, deal with this. And so we plead in the presence of the Lord. Now we are so, so blessed that we serve a gracious God. Yeah, Joan is a fool. Joan is an idiot. But God loves that idiot. I mean, he goes after him. He goes after him and he pulls him right back. Now, Joan didn't have to have uh, chapters 1 and 2. I mean, Joan didn't start off with chapter 3 with going to Nineveh, right? That would be great. Um, it would be much easier for Joan. But his rejection or his decision not to say yes to God meant that it was a lot harder getting to where God was going to get into in the first place. And that's true for us too. As a church, as individuals, you know, you, God, is, God is going to have his way with you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That can be an easy thing. And that can be a hard thing. And the decision is yours. So we see Jonah flees from the presence of the Lord, but the Lord has other plans. We'll talk about those next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for Jonah and helping us see through his foolishness our own foolishness. There are here, and I, I, I know this for a certainty, people who are not, not going in the direction you called them to go. For by your Holy Spirit and by the power of your Son Jesus Christ, I pray that uh, you, uh, you stop us. You call, you call our flight to a halt in some way, bring a storm into our lives, bring a whale or whatever you need to do, Lord, I pray that you stop us. I pray that you give um, us wisdom and faithfulness and a desire to fulfill your purposes for us in the world. Help us, Lord, to, to do an inventory of our life and to see those decisions that are coming up in light of your purposes and missions in the world and make decisions as disciples of the And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.